Well, great. Good morning, fellowship. Is that the best my 1045 can do? Come on. Good morning, fellowship. My 9 a.m. was like, good morning. You know, like they were hopped up on coffee. Man, I'm so encouraged. I love seeing you guys here at 1045. How many of you know that God can do exceedingly and abundantly more? than all we ask, than all we could ever imagine, than all we could ever dream or hope for. And what I love about being your pastor is that I'm getting a chance to see that happening in your lives. I'm getting the chance to experience that in this church, that God is alive, that he's moving in and amongst us, that he's adding to our numbers. And we like to say around here that we are about numbers because every number has a name and every name has a story. You see, we're about people. We want to make Christ known to the ends of the earth. And so I just love that we've moved back to two services today. And we are trusting and we are asking. I want us to be a people who are asking the Lord to increase our numbers. All right, today we're in week 10 of our 12-week summer series. Hope you've been enjoying it. We're learning some major lessons from these minor prophets. About six months ago, the preaching team and I got together. We were like, What do you know about the minor prophets? And I think maybe one of us knew one thing. And we're like, yeah, maybe if we don't know that much, they might not know that much either. That's how we find ourselves in this 12-week series. You made it to week 10, only two more weeks to go. Today we find ourselves in the book of Haggai. Right? Can we all say that? Haggai. We didn't all say that. Haggai. Aaron thought it was Haggai, but it is actually pronounced Haggai. Haggai. Steve, can you say that? Haggai. Haggai, There we go. The book of Haggai. It's the second shortest book in the Old Testament. 38 verses. But Haggai, this prophet, has a very important message. And it can be summarized in the form of a question. You see, Haggai comes in the year 520 BC, and he poses this question to the people of God, the Israelites. He says, what is the priority of your life? It was an extremely important question all those years ago, 2,500 years ago. It's an extremely important question for each of us to answer today. And I know we're all intelligent people here, so I'm not trying to patronize you, but I want to make sure we're on the same page because it's going to be important for us to understand what this word priority actually means. You see, a priority is defined as this we put that up on the screen, a priority. It's whatever comes first amidst competing alternatives. Webster's Dictionary defines a priority as anything with superiority in rank, position, or privilege. It's something that is given or meriting attention before, before competing alternatives. And so this concept of a priority, it's pretty simple. Whatever comes first amidst competing alternatives. But there's also a challenge when it comes to priority. You see, here's the reality. We all live in a world filled that is full of great amounts of choice. This is exactly what we find in the year 520 B.C. Haggai, the prophet, is sent by God to the people of God, the Israelites. 70 years they were in captivity. The the Babylonians came and they besieged the city of Jerusalem where they lived. They took all the people of God to, to their city. The city of Jerusalem was in ruin. 70 years they were in captivity until a people called the Persians came along. They defeat the Babylonians. There's your history lesson. And the Persians decide, We don't need the Israelites here in Persia. We're going to let them go free. And so about 50,000 Israelites in the year 520 B.C. returned to the city of Jerusalem. But here's the problem. You see, it was a great time in history. They were celebrating. They were worshiping the Lord for their freedom from captivity. And yet at the same time, when they get back to the city of Jerusalem, the city of God, The city is in ruin, and so is the temple of God. And so the Israelites, just like us, they have a choice. You see, God allows them to choose. Will they build their own city, or will they invest their time building the temple, the city of God? 
You see, they get to choose what comes first amidst a world of competing priorities, realities, things that are vying for our attention. So why don't you open your Bible? We're going to be in the book of Haggai. I wish I could tell you exactly where it is. I'm not sure off the top of my head. It's somewhere back there in the Old Testament. There's only two more chapters after this until we jump into the New Testament. So Haggai chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 1. Remember, it's only 38 verses. We're going to read just 11 this morning. This morning, I want us to think about, consider, and try to answer this question. What is the priority of your life? And maybe as we do, let's consider some of the consequences of our choice. All right? So Haggai chapter 1, let's start in verse 1. It says this. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses? Which simply means your luxurious houses. Haggai says, is it time for you to be living in your luxurious houses while this house, the house of the Lord, remains in ruin? Verse 5. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, verse 10, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces on men and cattle and on the labor of your hands. You see, here we find a record, a record of the events surrounding the return of these 50,000 Israelites. You know, a generation has passed since these people, the people of God, have been held in captivity by the Babylonians. And so when they are released by the Persians, not all of them decide to go. You know, some of, for some of them, especially the children of those who were taken into captivity, Babylon was all they knew. And so some of them go, about 50,000, and some of them end up staying in their new land of Persia. It was the year 520 BC, as I mentioned. It's now about 18 years after they have left Babylonian captivity. So it's not the second Haggai comes to to them. It's not when um, they have just been released by the Persians. 18 years have passed, and now God raises up and sends this prophet Haggai. You see, he has a very important question. I kind of already gave the spoiler, but in verse 3 it says this. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. He says, is it time for you yourselves to be living in your luxurious, your paneled houses while the house of the Lord remains in ruin? You see, this is an interesting question. It's an important question that Haggai is posing to the people of God because it was actually very obvious that these people had every intention to build the house of God. After all, they were the people of God. They loved God. They wanted to honor God with their lives. The book of Haggai doesn't record this detail, but we find in the book of Ezra, the prophet Ezra records the fact that the people of God, upon return, now 16 years prior to when Haggai is writing, 
had actually begun to build the temple. They had laid the temple. I want to read this for you very quickly. Ezra chapter 3, verse 8. Ezra writes this. He says, In the second month of the second year, after the revi- re- re- arrival of the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, and the rest of their brothers, the priests and the Levites, and all who had returned from captivity to Jerusalem, they began to work. Make a note of that. They appointed Levites 20 years of age and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Right? Then in verse 10, Ezra says this. When the builders had laid the foundation, right? So we know they had begun the building. They laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. The priests in their vestments with their trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols, took their places to praise the Lord as they prescribed by David, king of Israel. Verse 11, with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, he is good, his love to Israel, it endures forever. All the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. You see, it's not actually a question of whether these people intended to build the kingdom of God. They had every intention to be about the Lord's work. They had every intention to build the temple of God. It is the physical place where the glory of God dwelt in the Old Testament. And yet, 16 years has now passed. 16 years since they have returned from Babylonian captivity to the city of Jerusalem, And for some reason, the temple at which they had laid the foundation, it still is in ruin. The question is, why? Why had the Israelites started to build the temple of God, and yet they have now stopped for 16 years? Do you think that they had lost their faith? Maybe they rejected their beliefs. Maybe they turned their back on the things of God. You see, the answer to those questions is obviously not. They are the chosen people of God. These are the same people. They had witnessed God doing all these miraculous things, right? They stood on the banks of the Jordan. They saw God part the Red Sea. They experienced God's hand of provision as they wandered, literally in circles. I've been in this desert, right? They're in the desert, 40 years, walking in a circle that was probably only about a 10-mile radius. Some reason, they can't find their way to the promised land, and yet God showers down bread from heaven. These are the people that experienced that. They saw God. They experienced God do all of these things. So they hadn't turned their back on their faith. They, hadn't, they didn't have any less desire to serve God or honor God or glorify God with their lives. And yet just like us, the challenge was their lives in Jerusalem upon return. It, they were filled with great amounts of choice. Have you found this to be true? That your life Uh, It just seems like the older you get and the more we kind of go on, the more choices, the more options, the more things that we have to choose from. And this happens all the way from the very simple and seemingly mundane to the essentially critical things of life. And so I was talking to the preaching team this week, and there was some strong opinions about two beverages. Can you see these? I don't know why these two things draw such heated debate at times, and you might prefer the, the, the lower octane diet version of these. Do you, does anybody have a preference? Coke. Coke? I was talking to a server this week in a restaurant. She said that people actually get up and leave her restaurant if they don't have the beverage of their choice. It's very interesting. This is, it extends to things like coffee, right? I happen to love donuts, and I happen to drive from uh, Lake Lucerne to church almost every single day, right past a place called Dunkin' Donuts. Now, I try to limit the amount of donuts I consume in a year to a few fingers. Um, I try my best, 
But it's interesting because we have a choice. Do we stop at Duncan for coffee? Or do we drive three miles into the village? Maybe to Tame Rabbit or to Starbucks or another establishment. You see, this, this idea of choice, it kind of extends right across life. I know people get pretty heated about cats and dogs. It seems like you're either a cat person or a dog person. Paper, okay, see? Paper or plastic. There's this team called Ohio State, and I can't remember that other team in that place in Michigan, right? We have these debates. One more, one more, right? Because I was talking to Pastor Joe this week. I learned something very fascinating. You know the toilet paper? You take a roll of toilet paper, and when you load it into its holder, to me, there's really only one option, right? Do you load it so the toilet paper comes over or under? It's obviously over, right? Do we have any unders? Toilet paper loaders? Come on, be bold and courageous. Pastor Joe loads his toilet paper under. It's totally counterintuitive. It's obviously the wrong choice. You see, our lives are filled with choices. Some of them are simple and mundane. Some of them are essentially critical to our lives. And I started thinking about this, and I've thought about it a lot. We, we, our lives are filled with so many different choices. I call this the challenge of choice. It's actually a problem sometimes. It's a great challenge in our lives when we have too many choices. For example, just this week, I was sitting in my office. I think it was about one in the afternoon. It was Wednesday this week. And as your pastor, I was obviously deep in prayer and fasting and theological study because it was Wednesday, right? Or I might have been eating sushi and playing ping pong with Aaron. Um, we don't need to discuss that. But my phone rang. One o'clock, Wednesday this week. I get a phone call. And it's my good friend, Ben. So I stop what I'm doing, whatever it was that we were doing. And I answer the phone. Hey, what's up? And my good friend Ben, he pastors this really large church in Toledo, Ohio. Great church. Ben says, hey, what are you doing right now? I'm like, I'm a pastor. I'm obviously praying right now, right? He's like, I'm a pastor too. Come on. What are you actually doing, right? He's like, you got to come to Toledo tonight. So I'm like, what do you mean? What do you, you know? He, so he's inviting me to come to Toledo that same day. And so he tells me there's this really influential, popular pastor. He's quite a well-known guy. He was going to preach at his church that same night. He said, I want you to come to, to my church and then kind of hear what he has to say, but then you and him and I will go out to dinner, and you'll get to, to kind of hang out, and we'll get to pick his brain on, on all things church and how this goes, and it's like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And before I tell you what I decided to do, what would you do in that scenario? Right? It's only a two-hour drive, and the reality was I had gas in my car. And Jenny thought it was a pretty good idea that I went and hung out with this guy. And I really actually did want to go and have dinner with this guy. So what would you do? You see, the challenge of choices, at the very same time, I had also planned to take my son Noah to the park. And it seems like an insignificant or a trivial little scenario. But the reality is, this is the challenge of choice. Whenever we choose to say yes to one thing, we automatically almost always have to say no to something else. Have you experienced this? When you say yes to one thing, and sometimes we don't realize it, right? We just say yes, yes, yes. Are you one of these type of people? Yes, I will do that, and I will do that, and yes to this, and yes to this. And what you don't realize is when you say yes, that's great, but there are things by the very nature of your yes that you are saying no to at the very same time. And this is the same challenge the Israelites faced 70 years after their captivity. They've returned to Jerusalem and they haven't lost their faith. They haven't turned their back on the things of God. They haven't rejected their beliefs, but they chose they chose to prioritize the building of the city over the building of the temple of God. And so God raises up this prophet. His name is Haggai. 
And God says, I want you, Haggai, to go to the people, my people, and ask them a very simple question. What is the priority of your life, and why are you prioritizing building your own stuff over building the stuff that I have asked you to build? I want you to look at Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. It says this. It says, this is what the Lord says, right? So Haggai is representing the Lord here. The Lord is saying this. He says, these people say, these people have told me the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. And so the prophet Haggai comes to the people of God and he's like, hey, why have you prioritized building your own stuff over the stuff of God? And they're like, there's a very simple explanation here. It's obviously not time for us to engage in the building of the house or the temple of the Lord, right? Did they want to please God? Yes. Did they want to serve God? Yes. Did they want to honor him and glorify him with their life? Yes, yes, yes. They just wanted to build their own house more than they wanted to build the house of God. And this is a pattern that we see all throughout Scripture. We see God's people all throughout scripture engaging in this reality, this challenge of choice when confronted with these competing alternatives. So often the people of God, see this is not Haggai speaking to some random people who don't know God, who want nothing to do with God. This is the prophet speaking to you and I, people who love the Lord, people who want to honor and serve the Lord. And he's saying, what is your priority? I don't know if this sounds familiar to you, but we see this pattern dating back, going back to the very beginning of time. Anyone remember the Garden of Eden? Right, I love this, I love this uh, little account, right? In the beginning, God creates them, both male and female. He places them into the garden, and he says, here's what you, here's what you do. You can do basically anything, Right? You can go anywhere. You can do anything. You manage all these things. There's one thing you can't do. What's that? You cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do anything you want. Just don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know how the story goes, right? What do these people do? Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the one thing, the only thing that God had said you cannot do, and that is exactly what they do. They eat from the tree. Do you remember this? Right, Genesis chapter three. This has happened now. They've eaten of that fruit, the apple, and now God comes to them. God actually, literally, physically, he comes to them. I love this. And this is what happens. Genesis chapter three, verse eight. says this. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. See, God comes to them physically, literally. He is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, Well, who told you that you're naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Anyone remember how they respond? Right, I love this, right? Because I I see myself in their response, right? So I feel like I'm not alone here. This dates all the way back to the beginning of antiquity, the beginning of time. Adam says in verse 12, right? You know how it goes, right? He says, it was the woman. That's exactly, you read this story, right? It was the woman. She gave me the apple. She made me eat the fruit. And so God looks at the woman, right? And and God's like, well, you know, what do you have to say for yourself? And what's the woman say? It was the serpent, right? It was the serpent. The serpent made me do it. God says, how does this happen? Adam and Eve are kind of looking sideways at each other. He made me, she made me do it. See, this is a pattern that we see. It happens within each of us, within the people of God, right? We don't intend to focus, to prioritize our own stuff. But when we do, 
And when we are confronted in our spirits or when we are confronted by others, so often it is the case, just like Adam and Eve, just like the Israelites in the year 520 BC, that we make an excuse. Do you ever find this in your life? That you know you're, you're probably not prioritizing the things of God enough, and yet you find yourself kind of rationalizing, right? These are excuses. We find ourselves, and I'm preaching it myself here, right? This is a very simple message this morning, but it is so applicable to each of us because we do it all the time. Adam and Eve did it. The Israelites did it. And we do it as well. We make excuses for why we have priorities above the Lord our God. The problem is the very first commandment. Do you remember the first commandment? You see, God gives the Israelites, the people of God, these commandments. And it's not so much a list of you have to do this or I'm gonna do this. It's not what God wants from you. It's what God wants for you. You see, there is an order to the way things work in this created society that God has created. And God wants for you the fullness of his riches and blessing. He wants that in and through your life. And so God says in the very first commandment, what? I am the Lord your God, and you should what? Have no other God before me. Right, what is a priority? It's that which comes first. That which comes before other things that have competition, that are competing for your attention. So what's God saying about our priorities? And it's very interesting. I was reading this week. I didn't realize this. You see, we have our list of priorities. What are the things that we are going to prioritize in our lives? And I realized, or I learned this week, that the word priorities only came into existence about 20 years ago. It wasn't until 20 years ago because by the very nature of the de definition of the word priority, there are no other things before it. Right? Priority, not priorities. There is only one thing that can come first. And so God is saying, even in the very first commandment, God must come first. And if he's not, the problem is your life will soon be out of order. It might not be today and it might not be tomorrow, but what you will find, and this is what we're about to read in the prophet Haggai, what you will find is as much as you are trying to organize and order your life on your own, when you try to do it in your own strength and your own accord and your own power, your life quickly slips out of order. We see this with the Israelites. They haven't turned their back from God. But here in Haggai chapter 1, verse 5, Haggai comes and he asks them to do something very specifically. He says, I want you to consider your ways. Consider, give careful thought to your ways. Actually, there's only 38 verses in this whole book. And of the 38 verses, five of the verses are this very thing. Give careful thought to your ways. Consider your ways. Think about your actions. The literal translation of this verse is set your heart upon the things that you do. King Solomon says it like this in Proverbs chapter four, verse 26. He says, ponder the path of your feet. He says, then, when you ponder the path of your feet, all of your ways will be sure. You see, the prophet Haggai told the Israelites, he, he's inviting them. He's saying, come on, just take an honest look. Be honest with yourselves. If you're not gonna be honest with others, be honest with yourselves. Consider your actions. What is the priority of your life? Because it's interesting, the things that we talk about, the places that we go, the people we hang out with. If you want to know what your priorities are, look to those things. And Haggai is inviting us to do that. He's saying, consider the pattern of your life. Is God first or is something else? Haggai comes to the people. 
He says, you see, when the order, God's created order is out of order, there is a consequence. See, God, it's not what he wants from you, it's what he wants for you, but when it's upside down, when God is not first, there's a problem. Things are out of order. So Haggai chapter one, verse six, directly after he says, consider your ways, Haggai says this. Here's the result of what you've been doing on your own. Haggai says, you've planted a lot of stuff, but you harvest very little. He says, you eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you're never satisfied. You don't, you're not full. You put clothes on them. You put clothes on, but you're not warm. He says, you put money into your wallet, into your purse, and it's like you're putting it into a wallet or purse with holes in it. See, this is the problem. When we prioritize anything, anyone above the Lord our God, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, no matter what you want to do, ultimately you find that the outcome of all your greatest pursuits will be frustrating, will be fleeting, and will be full of discontent. See, that's what Haggai is communicating to the people. And that is our reality as well. We all live amidst this reality. Our lives are full of choice. And this is actually so often a great challenge because I would, I would guess, I would guess that most of us want to use our lives to, go, to honor God. We want to glorify God. We want him and his name to be uplifted. And yet the problem sometimes is we don't realize when we start to say yes to certain things, we're saying no to something else. So easy for God to take a back seat in our lives. Commenting on this reality, I came across this quote from one of the most famous uh, NBA basketball players of all time. So a number of years ago, he was making this quote in the USA Today newspaper, and I read it, and I just thought, man, this is so right on. He says this. He says, I've won so many different championships. I've accomplished all these things. I own three NBA rings. He says, I've got plenty of endorsement deals. But still, he says, I feel like I've yet to accomplish something. He says, I feel like there's so much more that I'm supposed to do. And he starts to question, he's, he's wondering, almost like I can hear his thought process in this newspaper article. And he's wondering to himself, is this how other basketball players have felt? Is this how other businessmen have felt? Is this how other doctors have felt? That you spend all your energy and your time and your, your pursuits doing these things and yet at the end of it all, you still feel unsatisfied. He says, I've done all these things, I've won all these things, I've got all this stuff. He says, in our society, the athletes, we're expected to care about winning games and pleasing the crowd and signing deals, and that's, that's it. But he asks this very important question. He says, am I supposed to obsess myself with all of these things and then get to the end of my career, get to the end of my life, wondering, was it worth it? You see, I think that's so spot on as we consider the prophet Haggai. See, when God is not the priority of our life, even the very greatest pursuits end up to be frustrating. They're often fleeting. And they're often full of discontent. And so this morning, I, I just want to create some space for us. And I've got uh, a lot more in my notes that we could cover. But as I'm standing up here, I'm just realizing as I've been going through this this week, man, it's preaching right to me, right? Because I wake up most days and I face the same challenge that you face. It's the challenge of choice. There's so many good things that I could give my time to, that I could give myself to, and I want to say yes to so many different things that it's so often the case that I find myself pushing, pushing, pushing God's agenda to the side. I find that I am so often inadvertently building my own kingdom instead of the kingdom, the temple of God. 
And so this morning, I've, I've asked the band to come up, and I simply want them to, to play a little bit. And I want you to consider this question. What is the priority of your life? I'd begin with where you spend time. I'd begin with the things that you spend a predominant amount of time thinking about. I'd begin with thinking about where do I go and what do I do on an average day? These are indicators of your priority. I want to create space right now for you to just consider your ways. You see, if you want God to be first, three things, and I'm not going to go through all the things here, but we don't have time. But three things, and these are so simple and yet they're revolutionary if you practice them. Number one, every single day, read. Read what? That's exactly right. Not the newspaper, not your iPhone. Read the Bible. Open up the Word of God. It's so simple, right? I'm not kind of, you know, this isn't rocket science. Every single day, you got to read the Word of God. It is the bread of life, the Word says. You see, I can't, you can't live without water. You can't live without food. And spiritually, the Word of God is our spiritual bread and water. We can't live without it. And yet, it's be, it'd be shocking if I asked you, and I'm not going to, to raise your hand and say, how many people here read the Bible, read the Word of God on most days? It'd be shocking how little of us, how few of us do it. You know, two years ago, my life totally changed. Noah entered our lives, and for 20 years, I had woken up and spent an hour to an hour and a half reading and praying and meditating. And over the last two and a half years, I'm like... You know, the reality of life, right? And we've got different pressures and things. All I'm trying to say is make sure God's first. It might not be in the morning. You gotta read every single day. You gotta pray, right? It's so simple. You gotta communicate with God. Psalm 17, verse six. It says, I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. I love what the Protestant reformer said. His name's Martin, Martin Luther. This guy was like, he was crazy. He, he, he worked on the things of God for like 20 hours a day and slept two or three hours. Somebody came to him one time and he's in the middle of translating the Bible. And, and this person says, hey, Martin Luther, what are you going to do tomorrow? And Luther says, man, I'm going to get up and I'm going to work. I'm I'm going to get up really early and I'm going to work until really, really late. And the the person's like, wow, I mean, that's that's great. He said, yeah, I am so busy. I'm going to do so much work that I'm going to commit the first three hours of my day to pray. Somebody, a contemporary said, we are too busy not to pray. Right, can you relate with that? I'm too busy. I've got to have the power of God in me and through me. I've got, I don't have enough to do it on my own. Last thing, we've got to be in community with one another. You want God to be first in your life? You got to read, you got to pray, and you got to fellowship. You got to be in community one with another. Colossians 3.16 says this, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and singing with thanksgiving to God. Fellowship, Haggai invites us. He invites every single one of us to consider our ways. This morning, God is with us, and he is saying to us, he is asking each of us, what is the priority of your life? You see, it's not that God is trying to get something from you. It's that God wants his riches and the fullness of his blessing to be active and alive within you. It's what he wants for you. That's why he asked this question, what's your priority? And so I want every head bowed and every eye closed and I'm just going to create space for a few minutes for you to consider this important question. What's the priority of your life? 
I'd look to where you spend time and what you talk about and who you hang out with. This is a moment between you and God. What's the priority of your life? Let's think about that. When peace like a river attendeth my way when so it would be the prayer of each of our hearts that we would not spend our time or spend our lives on things that really don't matter. None of us want to live a life in which we put on clothes but we're not warm, in which we drink uh, but we're not satisfied, in which we, we make money only to put it in a wallet or a purse with holes in it. And so Jesus, this morning, as your prophet comes and he, he questions, what is the priority of my life? Father, I'm praying that you would help us with our choices. As we walk out these doors and we live in the reality of a world filled with so many different options and choices, Father, I pray that we would live in the light of eternity that we would live with the glory of God that calls us to build the temple of God first. Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added unto you. And so Jesus, that's my prayer this morning over each of these in this room that you would help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and watch you add everything that we need unto our lives. We love you this morning. We bless you. We thank you for this time together. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.